There we go. Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning, and uh, it's good to have a slightly not so cold day. Um, last Sunday was freezing, and today is actually really nice. So it feels like summer is back, hey? And I hope it stays this way. I see we have a warm week ahead, actually, for the Anglo Bull. I'm sorry for the interschools. Um, we have a warm week. Sorry, I don't know how that got in there. We have a warm week ahead, so it's going to be short sleeves and shorts on the fields. We look forward to having that. We've been like kept awake 10 o'clock at night hearing like really loud chanting. We're like, what is wrong with these people? Like, who chants at 10 o'clock at night? Anyway, so I, we, I, we tolerated it. We're like, no, we know it's into schools. Um, yeah, well, good. Yanni's at home. Uh, she's got a bit of a tummy flu in bed, so please keep her in your prayers. So if you don't see her, that's where she is. And um, yeah, we are just so excited to be in this series together, and I can't wait to just dive in this morning. So I hope you're ready. Um, why don't you close your eyes for a second, and let's pray. And let's trust God to speak to us. Ulrich has already just helped us to get into that space of hearing from God. And yeah, let's close our eyes, still our mind for a second, and allow God to, to speak to us. Yes, Father, we... We just quiet our, our thoughts, Lord God, and we lay everything down at your feet right now. And we ask that you would come and speak to us through your word. Um, Lord, may it be that double-edged sword that cuts into us and changes us and transforms and heals and frees us. May your word, Lord, be, be food to our souls this morning. And I pray, speak to us, reveal yourself to us this morning. May your Holy Spirit anoint this mo the message this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning's message is titled, The Closeness of Jesus. And so if you've missed out the last couple of weeks, we've um, started with a series on knowing and following Jesus. And you don't really follow somebody that you don't know. And that's the premise of this whole series, is we want to get to know him personally and get to know every aspect of Jesus and his ministry and his character. And we've looked at the fact that he's inviting us, drawing us closer to himself, that he desires an intimate relationship with us. And we've looked at the fact that Jesus is both divine and human, and that we can't just accept his sacrificial servant human side without worshiping and glorifying him and making him the Lord of our lives, right? We need to acknowledge both um, sides of him. And then we looked at the fact that we were created by him and for him with the express purpose of glorifying him. And that in, in that we find meaning, in that we find fulfillment in life. So if you missed any of that, go ahead and, and watch those messages on YouTube. And we've been um, encouraging the church to read the Gospel of John. So if you've not started, why not start today? Get into the Gospel of John, even if it's just a few verses a day, and that'll feed you and it will just help you to get to know Jesus better. Um, it portrays him beautifully. And uh, I think a lot of the small groups have al already started with the small group discussion based on this series. So if you're not in a small group, um, complete a next steps card and we'll help you get slotted in. But small groups is a great way to really just dive into the content and to make it personal and make it practical because that's what we want the Bible to do. We don't want it to just be knowledge. You know, we want it to be personal. We want it to be practical. We want it to change our, our daily lives. And that's God's will for us. And so this morning I'm going to continue in the series, and we've been using a key passage in Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. Um, who's managed to memorize that? I'm hoping that next week when I ask that they will... Hey, Christy, put your hand up high. Oh, she didn't. Okay, okay. Has no, has no one managed? Okay, well, we'll get, we'll get there. We'll get there. All right, I, I'm going to encourage you again. Go and memorize Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. It's not that difficult. And it's on the screen, and we're going to read it together as we've been doing for the last couple of weeks. Are you ready? All right. And it says this, And now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow Him. Let your roots grow down into Him, and let your lives be built on Him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. 
So if you're new to Christianity and new to church, and maybe you've come this morning and you're visiting with somebody, a friend or whatever, and this is all very strange to you, then this is just the foundation of what we believe and what we do as followers of Jesus, that the calling on our lives is to know Him and to really plant our lives in Him as a tree is planted in soil, and to follow His example and to follow His teachings in the Word. That is the calling on our lives and to build our lives where He is the foundation, the bedrock of our faith. That's what Paul is trying to emphasize here in his letter to the Colossian church. And as we do that, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, as we build our lives on Him, we find our faith is strengthened, we find ourselves being able to weather difficult times, go through trials and temptations easily, because He is the foundation, and it cannot be shaken. And we find ourselves overflowing with thankfulness because of what Jesus has done for us, and because He is the fulfillment and the very, just the food of our souls. Amen? And this is what, what this is all about. And if you're new to Christianity, then I want to invite you to move past the clutter and all the, the, you know, all the hype and the stuff that you see sometimes about Christianity and church today and focus on Him. Get to know Jesus. Spend time in His Word to meet Him, to know Him, to love Him. That is the focus of, of us as followers of Jesus. And if you've been following Jesus for a long time, for, for many, many years, I want to encourage you to rekindle your passion for Him, rekindle your desire to know Him and to serve Him and to grow closer to Him. And, that's, and what this is about is to grow closer to Jesus because He is always drawing close to us, the closeness of Jesus. And we're going to jump back into John chapter 1, and we read that two weeks ago and read from verse 1 to verse 5, and then verse 14. And so John 1, verse 1 to 5 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So just to pause there, this is the, an introduction of who Jesus is, and the Greek word logos is translated as the word. It's this idea essentially in Greek of the personal revelation and the understanding of the, the God person, right? The, the, the supreme being in the sky in, the, in Greek philosophy. And, and this is then John's explanation. He says this is who he is. Jesus is that personal revelation, the logos, the revelation of the living God. And the word then is, is this, you know, in, incredible, like holy, glorious being, the Son is up there with the Father. He created everything. He puts, he sets the stage. He puts him up there at the, the, the place at the right hand of the Father. And he, and he explains how his, his light has come in this incredible way and broken through into our darkness. This is not really, earth is not really a place that this glorious God would want to be because it's just so broken and so messed up and so rebellious. And yet, Jesus comes, and He comes and he invades our darkness, and His light, the powerful light that He emits, is able to, to, to destroy and drive out that darkness in the world. And this is, this is such a beautiful picture of Jesus coming to earth, and then jump to verse 14, the next slide, the Word became flesh. So here He is, the Word glorious, alongside the Father, holy, He's created everything, he became flesh and blood. The, the, the message translation says he, 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 um, he became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. He moved into the neighborhood. He made his dwelling among us, John says. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So again, he's, he's trying to explain here he is, you know, flesh and blood, but we saw his glory. There were moments where heaven, heaven opened and the Father spoke over him. There were moments when he touched water and it turned into wine and where he took lame people by the hand and they started to walk and he touched blind eyes and they were opened. There were moments where he saw, we saw his glory. We saw we were in awe of his power as he stilled the oceans, you know, spoke to the wind and it settled. There, there, there was this moment of glory as the gravestone was rolled away and Lazarus came forth, right? And we've seen his glory. Yes, flesh and blood, but also the glorious God of heaven. 
And so we, we recognize both sides. And, and I love the, the, the idea of that he moved into the neighborhood, as the Message Bible said, that he came from his glorious throne and he came close to humanity. He became a neighbor to us, in, if, if you will, to draw near to the, the ones that he had created, even if we are the ones that have walked away and rebelled and have created our own distance between us and God. In his grace and his love for us, Jesus came close. And this is such an important concept to understand as we get to know him. Um, I think the, the challenge we face today is that in just our, the, our way of thinking, um, even in Christianity, but especially in religions in the world, it's the, the concept that we have of God is that he's this distant being up there in the sky. And a lot of religions have created statues and have created idols or, or physical images of stone or wood or whatever in order to somehow bring that God closer to them, even if it's just an image in a temple, just to get the feeling that he's there with us, right? The, the, the religions of the world have, have this sort of distant feeling, this distant idea of God, but if we think about Christianity, it's often the same. If you think about the way we look at God and the way we, we view Him, it's often in this way that He's far off, right? He's all the way up there, over there, and we're down here, and we're just hoping that if we talk, maybe He'll hear us, you know? Maybe He'll listen. You know, He's distant in, in the way we, we view Him and our perception of Him. Um, uh, I heard this, this really cool story of uh, a young kid who his mom's, you know, he had just come out of kids' church. He was ready to come to big church. And his mom said, okay, but you must be, you know, uh, settle down in church. Don't be too busy, you know, because it's, it's a holy place and all that. And so, you know, he's, he's there and he's, he's really restless and he's moving around on the, on the bench. And, and, he's, and his mom's like, yeah, settle down, sit down. And he's like, but mom, I can't see God. <laughs> And so she couldn't, she, she was obviously, everybody around her laughed and, you know, it was very funny, but this came from the idea that she said, we're going to the house of God. We're going to the house of God. And he's like, you know, he wants to get up and see God, but he can't see beyond the other big people that are sitting in front of him. I can't see God. And in a way, that's, that's just a, a funny way to illustrate how we view God sometimes is that we come to the space, we call it the house of the Lord. And we come and we meet together and then we, we maybe momentarily encounter the closeness of Jesus, right? Or maybe in a communion moment, and, and absolutely these are all true, and maybe in a worship service, um, you know, maybe even as we have that two minutes in the morning to, to have quiet time and, and whatever. And we consider those moments like holy moments, right? Those are special, those are precious, and they are like that. But did you know that the, the desire of God's heart is that you would walk in closeness with him every second of the day, that you would enjoy his presence and live as if he is walking right beside you. As if you move, as you get out the morning and have breakfast and, and, and by the coffee machine, making your cup of coffee, he's there with you, you know, enjoying the smell of the coffee bean that he created or whatever. He's there, and, and as you drive to work or to school, and as you go to the classroom, and as you go to work, and, and, and even in the pain, and in, even in the conflict, and, and whatever your life throws at you, is that you're aware of his presence every single moment of the day, and that you are actually, he's, uh, he's so accessible that you can have a conversation with him every second, every moment of the day. Jesus came close. He came to earth. He became flesh and blood to illustrate this idea, the closeness of Jesus. And I realized that when, when, you know, when life hurts and when we, when we face suffering, when we face brokenness and pain and whatever the case may be, is those are often the, the situations that shape our perception, not only of people, but of, of God. And we may even, in, during pain and loss and, and grief and suffering, we may even get this idea that God is not involved or that God doesn't care or that God doesn't love me or that he's just not present in my life. And we're not alone in that. The, the Bible shares so many people's just realness, and David is one of those people who's real. And he says this in Psalm 22, in a moment of, I think, real suffering and pain. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus quotes this on the cross, by the way. 
Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. He's, he's in this difficult space. He's, he's expressing his emotions so beautifully, and, you know, and God seems nowhere to be found, right? He's banging on heaven's door, and there's no answer. And I think that sometimes shapes our perception of God more than we know. And even in those spaces, we need to recognize his closeness. Psalm 34 says that God is close to the brokenhearted. God is close to the brokenhearted. And I wonder if we know Him that way, because God's desire is that you would know Him like that. How do you perceive God today? Are you, you know, just hoping for a moment here on Sunday morning in worship, or maybe with communion, or maybe with your baptism, you know? Sometimes we make something of those things that they aren't, you know? We turn them into some... some supernatural sacrament that, that they actually aren't, because all of them really, baptism and communion and Sunday worship, they all point to Jesus. He is the focus. He is the prize. He is the goal. He is the encounter. He is the one we long for, and the closeness that we, that we, that we long for every single day is possible. God wants that for us. Do we want it? Do we desire it? Are, do we long for that kind of closeness, that kind of intimate relationship? Because that's what we were made for. And even if you look at our human relationships, have you noticed how we long to be close to other people? Um, the pandemic showed that very clearly with all the lockdowns and the restrictions. When they, they had this moment where they, we could all go running again, I think, I don't know when, how far that was into the thing. But it, it, it had been like hard lockdown, and they're like, you can go running. The Minister of Health announced they were all gripped at the TV watching her announce this thing, but only within five kilometer radius. People who you never saw in your life, even you didn't even know they had running shoes, they were suddenly running. <laughs> all the extroverts were like, yay, people, you know. It was like the little mermaid, I want to be where the people are, you know that. Um, that's how it was. And we were like in the streets, oh, so happy to see each other. How are you? Nobody went for a ride. We all went to talk to each other. <laughs> there was no social distancing. And it was just, it was very funny. But it, it, this was just illustrates that there's this, like, it's hardwired in us that we want to be close to people. We want to be close to each other in relationships. And, and that's why isolation is so bad for you, right? But in the same way, God designed us to be close to Him. And if we jump back to Genesis and we see God's design for Adam and Eve, we see this to be true because in Genesis, even after they had sinned and disobeyed God, Genesis 3 verse 8 says, when, um, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, maybe that was God's favorite time of the day, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. He was going for a stroll, figure that, in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. We all know that it's not possible to hide from God, but that just again illustrates how we perceive God incorrectly, right? That there's nothing I can do to hide from Him. Every moment of my life is laid bare before Him, right? But God, even, if the, even though they had rebelled, even though they had, He should have just struck them with a lightning bolt, right? He should have just ended it there, hit you know, undo on the keyboard of heaven or something, or hit delete or whatever. You should have just done a, a cosmic delete button where you just reset everything, right? You know how you love that undo button. And yet, in his wisdom, in his infinite wisdom, he decides to go down and have a walk with them in the garden, where you just want to give them like a clap. What have you done? All of us today are still suffering because of everybody getting to heaven. Is, Adam, is that you? You know, we've got something to... I'm sure they've got him in a special corner, him and Eve, you know, because there's some angry people that are like, <laughs> so, the <laughs> and he goes for a walk with them. Get your head around that. He goes for a stroll with Adam and Eve, who disobeyed him. He gave them everything. He gave them the best place to live on earth. He gave all of creation for them to steward over. And in his grace and in his love, he comes down for a stroll in the cool of the evening. The closeness of Jesus is just beautifully illustrated in this. And he says, come, I want to walk with you. In your lost, broken state, in your rebellious like prideful state, I'm going to have a walk with you. Come, let's talk. I'm here. I'm close. You know, that's what we were made for. 
And God's design through Jesus is that we then come back to that relationship of closeness with Him. And yet we create so much distance between us and God. Isn't that true? In spite of our, I think, best efforts today with technology, we, we are more connected than ever with people in the history of mankind. Never have we been so connected as we are now. And yet never has the, the rate of loneliness been so high in humanity as it is today. The rate, rate of you, just loneliness and people feeling isolated from each other, according to studies, is at an all-time high. This connectedness of WhatsApp and Facebook creates the illusion that we are close. Even sitting in a chair on a Sunday or opening my Bible can create the illusion that I'm close to God. Am I right or am I wrong? It can create this illusion where I have religious activity in my life, and I can appease my sense of guilt even or appease my feeling of the need for connection with God maybe slightly and, and then I run off in my day and I forget about Him. Craig Rochelle coined this term Christian atheism. He said it's when you believe in God but you live as though He doesn't exist. And I was like, geez, that's, what a brilliant title. It's got a book about it. It's a great book. When you believe in God but you live as though He doesn't exist. And I've been there many times Many times in my moment of anger, in my moment of weakness and falling for sin or temptation or whatever, I've been there in the times where I've only cared about what I want instead of what my wife needs or what my kids need. I've been there and I've lived and believed in God but lived as though He doesn't exist. But I've come to know Jesus and I've come to see His grace and His heart and His love and His desire for closeness with me and it's brought me to the place where I can, where I can draw near to Him. And, and without fear of being punished, without fear of being judged. And this is God's heart for us. God will never create distance between himself and you. He has no reason to create distance between us. We are always the one to create distance between us and him. Always. It will always be up to us whether we draw near to God. Jesus came close to us, and he came close to his disciples on earth. The 12 apostles walked with him daily. He, he did this to illustrate the kind of relationship he would have, not only with them, but for every disciple, every follower of Christ to come. And when you read the Gospels, see his, his mannerisms, see his way of life, see the way that he worked and lived with the disciples, and desire that. Consider that to be the norm. Because daily he ate with them. You know, he shared the same table with them. They walked everywhere. He didn't get up in a lecture hall and, and some seminary or something and give them teachings. He let them come along with him on journeys to all sorts of places, boat rides across oceans and seas or whatever. And he said, watch me. Follow my way of life. Examine my example and, and, and let that be your way of life. Listen to my teachings. They were in his space. He was in their space. There was always closeness. And we see that even after Jesus left, the disciples continued to live as if Jesus was always right there with them. They continued to, to work and to move in the power of the Holy Spirit and with the leading of the Holy Spirit, as if Jesus was always right there. A beautiful example is in Acts chapter 4, where the disciples, Peter and John and the guys, have done it, well, God's done a miracle through them, and a lame guy walks, and they start proclaiming the gospel, and then the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, the council, pulls them in, you know, shuts the door and tells them, you know, who gives you the right? It gives you the power to say these things or do these things. And then Peter boldly begins to proclaim the gospel and who Jesus is. He talks about Jesus and he can't help it. And for a moment, they have to like confer the Sanhedrin. They're like, what do we do with these guys? And then in Acts 4 verse 13, it says, and now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Like, there's only one explanation for these guys being so radical. They hung out with him. They were different because they spent time with Jesus. I wonder how different I would be and how different we would be the more I spent time with him. Hey, how Ulrich spoke about just if we can move out as two or three hundred of us in this community and touch just one life this week, how incredible that would be if Jesus could shine through us, if people could look at us and go, you must have been spending time with Jesus because there's something about you that just doesn't fit the surroundings or your normal way of life, right? They had hung out with him, they changed, and they lived as if he was always still with them. 
we see that Jesus drew close to people in their broken state, in their lost state, in their normal daily life. He hung out at weddings and funerals. He crossed oceans to visit demon-possessed people who cut themselves in grave sites, lived, lived there as complete outcasts. He singled those people out and he went for them, hung out with lepers. He was accused of, of spending time with tax collectors and sinners. Luke 15, he ate with tax collectors and sinners. He was at, in their homes, at their tables, close to them, right? And sometimes you may even feel unworthy. Oh, you know, God may want to hang out with those guys because they're spiritual, but not me. I've do, done too much wrong. But he, he came close. He came close to Adam and Eve in the garden, and his desire is to come close to you. He's available. He's reachable right there where you are. And his desire is that you would know him that way. You'll see that Jesus promised that he would always be close to us. Jesus promised that he would always be close to us. This is his promise in the Word. Just before Jesus ascends to heaven and leaves his disciples, he gives them the great commission to go and make disciples. And we read that in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, and we see how he ends this commission. You can jump to the next slide. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. He says, you can know this 100%. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, I guarantee my presence. I guarantee you my closeness. You don't have to suffer through life. You don't have to live the Great Commission without me. You don't have to try and be, you know, and work hard and strive to be a better person or a better Christian on your own strength. He says, I am with you. My Holy Spirit lives, it will live in you and will be your strength and your guide and your self-control and your joy and your love and your patience and on and on and on, right? He says, I am with you. His presence is His promise to us. Again, the disciples go on missionary journeys. They travel to foreign nations as Jesus commanded. They go and evangelize Paul and the other oaks, Barnabas. They, they go and, and, and go to places that are completely pagan. Jews would never set foot in those places because they know the closeness of Jesus. They have no fear because they know His presence is with them. At some point, even they get turned away from going to a specific place. And I'll just use this as one example in Acts 16 verse 7. It says, then coming to the borders of Messia, they headed north for the promise of pro province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So aware were they of His presence and His closeness that when, when, uh, when, God's, when Jesus speaks through His Holy Spirit, they write, the Spirit of Jesus prevented us from going. They were like, okay, Lord, you're with us here. We're walking as if you're walking with us. We won't go there, right? We can actually live this way. We can actually know Him this way in our lives. His closeness is His promise to you and me, not just for the hyper-spiritual or the, the well-to-do or the ones who live sinless, perfect lives. He comes to our brokenness. He meets you in your rebellion. He meets you in your hurt and in your pain and in your bitterness. And as you allow Him in, that's when healing and repentance begins to take place. That's when your life begins to be transformed. But as long as we keep Him at arm's length and we keep Him as the Sunday Jesus there in church on the stage or up in heaven, as long as we keep Him at a distance where we only you know, allow a little compartment on a Sunday morning between 8.30 and 9.30 or whatever, you know, that's, that's his box. We give him that. As long as we compartmentalize him like that, we will never know the full life that he called us to live. We will never know the fullness of his strength and his grace in our lives. You can't confine him to a baptism service or a communion or a worship set, or you cannot confine him to a building or a space. He's everywhere, always, at the same time. And as followers of Christ, he lives in you. That's another mystery to unpack. Talk about closeness. He lives on the inside. Can you hear his heartbeat? Can you hear his voice this morning? And do you long to know his voice? Do you long to know his heartbeat? To be closer to him. His closeness is his promise. And then his closeness, Jesus' closeness, is proof of his love for us. When you love someone, you can't help but want to be in the same room as them. Isn't that true? Uh, my wife 
you know, one day ph phoned me up, and we had just gotten to know each other. I don't, know if, I don't think we were dating yet, but she's like, she got locked out of the house. Um, she's got nowhere to go. Can she come and hang out at, at my place? And I'm like, you really got locked out of the house. Okay. <laughs> I think that's just the story that she used because she wanted to spend time with me. And that's my side of the story, but you'll have to hear her side. But isn't that true? When you fall in love with someone, you're like, I can think of all kinds of reasons and excuses just to be with that person, right? To hang out with them. You know, oh, you know, I just drove past your house and I couldn't help. I had some time, so I popped in, you know, how are you? Yes. <laughs> and I wonder sometimes if we realize how much he loves us. Because if he does, don't you think he would want to be very close to us? And if I love him, don't you think I would want to be very close to him, right? Isn't that true? And want to hang out with him and want to listen to his voice and want to get into his word and want to worship him and want to tell others about him. You tend, when you meet somebody great and you fall in love, you can't stop talking about them, right? It's all over Facebook. Look, you know, look who I met. And they love me and I love them and you can't stop talking and to other people's, you know, annoyance, but they, you know, understand and they're gracious. And, but that's what in love people do. And I think if we fall in love with him all over again, we, will, we won't be able to shut up about him. Like the disciples couldn't keep quiet. There was this boldness about them. They can't stop talking about him. He's the lover of our souls. Or is he? And, and I know that sounds harsh, but I, I have to ask myself those hard questions sometimes. And maybe you need to ask yourself the hard questions. It's that kind of love that God says is just unbreakable. And Paul emphasized this beautifully at the end of Romans chapter 8 in verse 38 to 39. He says, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from God's, the love of God that is revealed in who? Christ Jesus, our Lord. He's like, covering all the bases, all the way from the top of heaven to the bottom of hell and everything in between, right? Nothing is ever able to separate us from that love, that intense, unbreakable, faithful love that he has for us, revealed to us in Christ Jesus. This is God's heart for us, and his closeness is evidence of that. His love is also evidence of his closeness. It works in both directions, and it's an invitation for us to draw near to him. Jesus saw the Samaritan woman in John 4, and he didn't stand on the soapbox all the way over there because Jews didn't mix with Samaritans. They were like half-breed, to, to use a harsh term, but they were considered less Jew than, than, the, than the, the normal Jew. And he goes and he hangs out at a well where he knew she would come to draw water in the middle of the day. She was ashamed of her way of life. She wouldn't go the normal time in the morning when all the other women would draw water. She goes in the afternoon when it's quiet, and he's there, and he asks her for a drink of water. And he has a discussion with her. And he, he reveals the deepest secrets of her heart. And at the same time, the, but the closeness and the love and, and the grace of Jesus transforms her life. And she witnesses to her, her town. And they come and hear Jesus. And they are uh, transformed. And their lives are changed. And there's a ripple effect. Jesus doesn't stand on some platform or a soapbox somewhere. He drew close to her. And that's the invitation for us as well. He's drawn close to you. He's come in the flesh. He was born as a man, and he came to earth, and his spirit is here, drawing close to you and me. And the invitation is, come close to me, draw near to me. He knows the intimate details of your life. The psalmist understood this. The, the, the writings of David show this beautifully in Psalm 139, verse 1 to 10. He says this, O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when, I'm, when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. The next slide says, You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. 
I can, excuse me, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. Sorry, if I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. He's like, he's close, always, all the time, everywhere I go. I cannot run away from him. He knows the details of your heart and your life. He knows what's going on. You can't hide from him. You can't hide your sin from him. Might as well open up to him, right? Might as well lay it bare before him and allow him to heal you and, and forgive you and to restore you. Amen. So many Christians live in the dark today, live double lives, live behind masks, give Jesus a box on a Sunday morning to be in, and you're unhappy, and you're, your life is without joy, and you struggle to show love to people, and God says, come close to me, come out of, the, come out of hiding, come out of darkness. His light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. He came and he became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood, into your neighborhood, into this neighborhood. Let him in, allow him in. Lastly, we were made to live with a constant awareness of God's presence. We were created for that, to live and to walk as if Jesus were walking right next to us. And as we do that, we get to know him. As we do that, we'll have glimpses of his glory. We'll have glimpses of hearing his voice, sensing his peace, sensing his gentle conviction, sensing, sensing his strength in times of weakness, in trials and tribulations. We will know his closeness. We will find life is so different from his viewpoint. Life is so much better with him side by side. Won't you close your eyes for a second? Close your eyes and give God the space to move in you and to work in you right now. And if you've put him in a box and he's been confined to two minutes in, in the morning or Sunday morning hour worship or whatever, if he's been confined and he's been given a religious space in your life, won't you come and just confess that to him this morning and say, Lord, I'm sorry for compartmentalizing you like that. I I need to know you the way Adam and Eve knew you, the way the apostles walked with you. I need to know you the way that Paul and Barnabas heard your voice on their missionary journeys. I want to know you like David knew you. I want that kind of intimacy. I want your presence and your closeness in my life. I want you to express that to God this morning. Lord, we lay our lives bare before you and we choose to put down the masks, to come out of the darkness, to come out of hiding where that may be the case. And we choose to repent of sin, Lord, and to draw near to you because of your grace and your love for us. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And so we come, Lord, with glad hearts, knowing that you've come to be close to us. We come to you with joyful hearts because we know that you've forgiven our sins and nailed them on the cross. We come this morning with excitement because we get to hear your voice and experience your presence every minute of the day. And may that be true for us, Lord God, not only when we read the Bible or come to church on Sunday, but when we go to school, when we go to grocery shoppings, when we play with our kids or when we go and run errands or when we sit in the classroom or at the desk at work or whatever the case may be, farming on the lands, Lord God, we would enjoy your presence. We would enter into conversation with you. We would experience your strength, your love inside, Lord God, and then it would bubble out of us. Thank you for your closeness. And may your Holy Spirit fill us right now because we can't do this without your Spirit. So come, Holy Spirit, and fill us and saturate us and work through us this morning. For every hungry heart, you, you can just extend your hands and receive your, your, your Father's gift for you, the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your gift, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. Come and fill every hungry heart here this morning. Saturate us, we pray. Empower us, we pray. Pour your love out, out on us. Free us from the bondages of sin and addiction and our past. Heal us from past hurts and trauma 
and, and, and teach us to forgive as, as Ulrich prayed this morning, to let go of past hurts, Lord God. May we walk in freedom. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You may be here this morning and you're just observing and you don't really know where you are with God right now, and, but you sense Him stirring in your heart and, and you know that He's called you. You know that He's invited you to know Him. As we've just seen with communion, Jesus died on the cross and gave His life, and then He was ra raised again on the third day to life. He gave His life so that you may have life. He took the punishment that was meant for you, for your sin, upon Himself on that cross. And the invitation stands to you this morning is to believe in Jesus as the Son of God and to make Him your Lord and Savior, giving your life to Him and receiving eternal life in return. And I want to invite you this morning, if you know that it's time for you to make that decision, it's time to stop walking the road by yourself, it's time to stop struggling in your own abilities and wisdom, it's time to come clean before Him. I want to invite you this morning, if you are ready to make that decision, then raise your hand boldly just where you are seated. And allow God, thank you, allow God to just fill you this morning with strength and courage. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, you can lower your hands. Praise God. Thank you, you may open your eyes and I wanna just invite you, if you raise your hand this morning, four or five of you raise your hands, I wanna encourage you to take a bold step after the service, move to there under the cross, there will be some prayer hosts there and they've got some, 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 just some info to share with you and to pray with you. And I want to encourage you to complete a salvation card in the chair pocket in front of you and allow us to help you to start your journey with God. Discipleship is not something done in isolation or in secret. It's done in community. And I want to invite you afterwards, don't run off to the, to the cafe. Stay for prayer. Allow somebody to pray with you and to lead you to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's glorify God for those salvations. Amen.